Right. There are things where I'm I'm afraid that you know like by telling him I'll be judged for mm. or like uh you know it's just me. So I I don't think it's like people's problem. Mm. <laughs> I think I think it's just me. Um like I take really uh, really long to open up to people. Welcome to another episode of Are You Okay? And today we welcome Naomi Neal with us. Hey Hi. Naomi, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. And as always, we have the very lovely Jeannie to join us as well. She's a psychologist and she's going to jump in at some points to help with whatever sort of situation. In fact, if you have questions for her, you can always ask her okay. as well. Now let's jump right in, Naomi. I want to know, I mean, you've been doing this, you've been in this game for so long. You're a seasoned veteran. Tell us about how it all began as a teenage vlogger and starting at such a young age till now? I first started everything because of, um, I guess, the fact that I didn't really have anybody to talk to. Um, mm. So, like, um, in fact, I first started having a blog before I even ventured into, you know, doing videos. Right. So, um, when I first started a blog, I was only about 11. Wow! Yeah. So, I mean, I heard about the platform like blogger yeah um because of um like blog blogspot yes. yeah like and wordpress or like yeah. tumblr you know like these um platforms i heard it um because i was hanging out a lot with my seniors uh, who were already on it and then um i started sharing more about my life because of um the issues uh, i was facing and mm -hmm. that i didn't really have anybody to talk to as well okay so um yeah, I guess that was how it started and obviously it made me who I am today because of um, everything or every experience that I got from doing this at a young age. Yeah. So like, you know, comments, like negative comments or like things that people have to say about me or the way I was being judged. How did you deal with it then? Mm, I, I don't know, like I felt like I was just coping with everything along the way. Um, as, as it goes. Yeah. So back then, we obviously didn't have um, like the platforms we have today yeah. to, to seek mm -hmm. help. Um, it was very limiting, the mm -hmm. amount of things that we can learn or the knowledge or information that we can right. find. But I think when you talk about dealing with negativity, I wouldn't say I'm the best at dealing with it as well because there were definitely moments where... Um, I felt like maybe this isn't for me or like um, there were a lot of things that I needed to change myself okay. uh, for, which is why I feel like um, until today, I still struggle with my own voice because mm. I feel like growing up at such a vulnerable stage where I, I think everything's very volatile, right? So yeah. um, I, without really knowing about myself back then yet, and with all these different voices telling you how you're supposed to act, how you're supposed to look, mm -hmm. how you're supposed to be. Yeah. Um, with all these different comments, I feel like I grew up having these voices in my head. Okay. That, you know, every single time I do something, I need validation from other mm -hmm. people on mm -hmm. whether it's right or wrong or right. whether I'm, I'm doing good enough. So I think that really affected me um, as a person even until today. I'm actually hearing a lot of self-doubt. Mm. Was that what you were experiencing? Mm, yes, for sure. Every single day. Like even as right. a parent now, yeah. um, I'm bringing it on a as a mum. Like mm. when I do certain things with my, my children, the way I bring them up or the things that I teach them, I constantly have this um, lack of confidence on the mm. decisions that I make. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Obviously, back then when I even started a blog, my relationship with my parents back then um, was not like the best um, because of, I, I guess it was like a vicious cycle because of the things that I did. My relationship with my parents got worse. So I started doing more of what I wasn't supposed to do. Like, for example, sharing things online, okay. which maybe my parents were not comfortable about. So that created more tension between us as well. Okay. So it just kept growing. And then the yeah. more they didn't want to talk to me, the uh, rather the more they didn't want to listen to me, yeah. the more I started to talk about it online and right. sharing about it online. <laughs> I think previously I did um, a couple of interviews where I shared about uh, how, I, I mean, it's not the best thing to talk about but like uh about losing my virginity at a really young age yeah so like that was i think the breakthrough in a sense or like um the reason that caused 
the main bulk of my problems, whether it's in school or um, my relationship with people and my parents as well. You mean mm. sharing that was was the main bulk? Mm, of, I think of going it? through that going and sharing that. that. Okay. So like the repercussions from sharing that, right. and then obviously um, the act on its own. I would say that I didn't understand the severity of like putting mm. certain things online at that point. Okay. Mm-hmm. So. For some reason, it went viral. Yeah. I mean, in in back then's context. Mm, I mean, maybe yeah. today, if like it goes up, like nobody cares. Yeah, right? Maybe yeah, it's yeah. just like ten views, for it's example. Just... <laughs> <laughs> but, like, back then, I was just like, it felt like the whole school knew Correct. about it. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's not something to be proud of. Like, and obviously, I didn't put it up, um, thinking that it was something to be proud of. It was more like if I didn't recall wrongly, my whole purpose or the whole purpose of putting it online was just to clear my name because okay. um, of how things were spreading around like mm. rumors in school okay. and like I just felt misunderstood and like um, the whole story was just kind of just not how it really was yeah mm. so I put it up to kind of ju- just share my side of the story yeah, yeah but without knowing it will lead to such um, heavy mm. consequences yeah, yeah. Yep. how is your relationship with your parents now i mean mm. like you know from from all these after all these mm. years i think um it definitely improved after becoming a mom myself mm. because that was the moment where i started being more empathetic i did i, I would say like because that's when i actually know oh you know maybe my parents did this because of this so i just try to relate to them yeah and i think that was kind of the bridge to our relationship where things got better but um it, it struggled for a really really long time like mm. i feel like there was just um i felt like it was very hard for for me to be hurt by them because okay. it's like when i'm trying to speak i feel like they're not really listening okay. um, back then. Yeah. So like years ago when, when I was still living with them. And obviously moving out also um, changed our relationship because, you know, time with them is so limited, right? Yeah. So whenever mm-hmm. we get together, I think we actually spend more time focusing on each other's mm. um like catching up rather yeah, than quality the flaws. time, yeah, right? Rather than our yeah. flaws and yeah. all the negativity. So like we don't talk about that anymore. We don't fight as much anymore. Okay. So I, I think that really helped with the relationship. I'm actually just very curious, right? Like, um, because it seemed like you journeyed with your parents for, for long and then um, right now the relationship is somewhat better. Yeah. Right. And um, would you actually say that they're now in your support system? Um Yes and no. Okay. Because I feel like they've always been there. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just me. Like I feel that um I don't know if it's something that I've like I don't know if it's always been me, like I've always been like that, or it's because of um everything that I've been through. But I have like serious trust issues. Mm-hmm. Um mainly because I feel like my trust has been breached many, many times before. It's like right. um whenever I share something with someone, I feel like I don't really have a safe space where I can truly voice my thoughts and mm. not be judged for the things I say okay. or the things I did. I, I really think that maybe the issue lies um, with myself. I think I grew up, I remember early on when I mentioned that I'm not someone with a lot of self-confidence. I feel mm. with that being said, I do have this tendency of not wanting to share with people uh, my problems because I feel like I'm, I might be burdening them. Um, mm. with these issues and I think we are at the age where everyone has their own issues yeah. um, everyone's struggling in a way or another so like why if if I can try and cope with it on my own I feel like maybe there's no need to no else Naomi no <laughs> oh, share oh my god <laughs> yeah. because it's hard I mean yeah. life is tough uh, and, and the stuff that you go through. Yeah. I mean, as a mom, as a successful woman, my gosh, you need to let it out <laughs> yeah. at some point. Yeah, so like, I, I would feel that, um, yeah, maybe, you know, if I don't share about it, then I'll just go back to my usual doing right, which is go online and talk about it. When, yeah. When I feel like there's really something that I, I genuinely just want to share. And I think by sharing things online, it's not always, you know, like a bit of roses. Like sometimes there will be days where you mm-hmm. share certain things and you get... Um, I don't know, trashed for it, but like, um, 
I mean, I try to be as safe as possible with the things I put up today as well. <laughs> yeah, I think. Are you I, are you safer now because you have kids? Is that yeah, what it is? Mainly, yeah, mainly, mainly, yeah, and I think maybe age as well. So mm-hmm. I. I feel there are a lot more responsibilities at this point. Okay. Um, a lot more people to answer to. Okay. Um, and a lot of more like consequences to think about as well. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm like relatively a lot more. Um, I would say quiet in a sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not because I don't have thoughts going on in my head. Yeah. Not because I'm not opinionated anymore. Mm. But I feel like I just some things are just better left unsaid. You okay. Know? Yeah. You know, it sounds to me like, you know, online used to be kind of like a safe space, even though you knew that you couldn't share, you know, very openly about things, mm. but you used to go up there to kind of, even now, you know, yep. you used to talk about things up there and it did help in a way, right? Yep. And then, um, so your audience and their online, create, on, online um, community create that safe space for you. Mm. However, it sounds to me like it's not as safe now, right? Yeah. So going back to um, that safe space and the people, uh, maybe people whom you can trust, right? Mm. Maybe think about what, what, um, what is safe to you you know, what will make a place or a person safe to you mm. such that you can open up? Mm. Do you have anything in mind right now? But oh, for, for sure. Mm. So like, I think the the person that I, I would think of um, straight away would definitely be my, my husband. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he's my partner for a reason. So like, mm. I feel that um, he's someone that I can fully trust. But at the same time, because of my... Um, trust issues. I feel like even until today, we've been together for seven years. There are things where I'm I'm afraid that, you know, like by telling him I'll be judged for mm. or like, uh, you know, it's just me. So I, I don't think it's like people's problem. Mm. <laughs> I, think, I think it's just me. Um, like I take really, uh, really long to open up to people. Well, I think one tip that you probably can take away um, is that um, think about what makes your husband safe for mm. you, right? You may not have the answer right now, which is fine, but but think about that and see whether you can find that you know that what makes what makes him so um, safe for you to open up yep. and see where you can find that in maybe other people. Mm. So that can help to maybe you know expand mm. your support system mm. in a way. You may not want to share um, certain things with the husband, but you can share with some some other people, right? Mm. And um, likewise. So yep. maybe think about that, then that can help you to, you know, expand mm. a little bit, then you can spread out a little bit. And slowly over time, as you approach people, you talk to people, um, you start to open up, it becomes easier. Mm. Not easy, but it's mm. easier. Mm. Yeah. It's so funny, right? We're talking about um like I mean, when you're married, I guess you always think like, you know, your yeah. your spouse has to be like all encompassing. Mm. Like you should be able to like you know, hear my thoughts and be non-judgy about it, whatever. But actually, they're they're human too, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, sure. and there's some things that they may not be able to grasp mm. or understand or or understand from our perspective, mm. isn't it? So it's so important to like find other avenues. Uh, in other people to sort of yeah. go like oh I can talk to this friend about this but I cannot talk to this friend about that right. you know yeah. and that in itself is a gamble because it's mm. like if I tell something to somebody who is who is not a safe space and then you get hurt and then you're like oh my god I'm just going to keep quiet I'm not going to mm. tell anybody anything anymore right, yeah, right. it's such a real yeah, thing yeah, isn't yeah, it yeah, yeah. But, and, and, and I guess that's, that's the problem as well because you know um, you know by relying on one person, it puts a lot of pressure on this that's person right. as well. And that's something that I only learned about um, maybe in the last couple of months mm. because I, I feel like um, there used to be this um, expectation uh, of my husband to be there for, to cater to all my emotional needs, you know, and to listen to everything that I, I have to talk about. That's how it used to be for me as well with like past relationships. That's why I said it's very warped um, in a sense where I think that, oh, to to um, be a perfect, like to be even a boyfriend, oh, you need to be yeah. this, 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 yeah. and that, 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 that. And then the moment they fall short of those expectations, you think that, oh, they're not boyfriend material. Uh, yeah, but then it's, it's not them, it's me, you know. So like, I feel it's about recognizing what you should be what's right to expect of people as well. Okay. Um, mm. Because I feel like it's it started to become a bit unhealthy. Like the way I was really trying to um, transfer all the energy onto my kids. Right. Um, like I started having these kind of expectations as well for them to be there for me. And then that was the moment I realized actually that, oh, why am I expecting my child, who was only four back then, um, to be 
be emotionally ready for me, you know, as right. in like, he's not even at the, the, the age yeah. where he's capable of doing that, you know. So why am I expecting um, him to understand my emotions, you know, I should stop acting like that. So that was when I realized that there was a problem with myself and that I had to really go out and meet people again mm. and yeah, find connect mm. like like connect with people basically. What I'm hearing is there's a lot of pressure for you to hold on to, you know, your distress all by yourself, right? It, it sounds to me <laughs> like, oh, I cannot put it on my children. Um, I mean, rightfully so in a sense, because like you mentioned, they're young, you know, mm. they might not be able to understand, they cannot mm. hold the space for you. Mm. However, um, what I find, you know, really kind of like a positive thing from there is that you talk about self-awareness. Right, this is something um, each time when I'm in therapy, right, I'll tell my clients, this is one thing I cannot teach you, right? Yeah. Self-awareness is something that I can't teach you. You have to cultivate yourself. Okay. What I can do is to guide you, you know, to probably give you a little bit of homework after sessions to see how you can cultivate that outside of session. So I thought that that was really great because mm -hmm. you were aware that, hey, I caught myself, you know, maybe kind of releasing or dumping my stuff to my child, children, and then mm. I stop it, mm. right? Um, I think moving on is more of like, okay, then who can I, you know, find to help support that? Yeah. Because yes, you know, we all want to be superheroes, you know, to be super yes. humans, right? And we want to all want to carry our own issues, <laughs> but yes. it is it is not possible. And if it's possible, I think it'll be our job. Huh? That's true, that's true, <laughs> that's, that's true. true. <laughs> You're right, Jeannie. <laughs> So, well, I guess um, it is in a way helpful to then, you know, I like that you say that you start connecting with people because mm. that's the first first step you need to take, you yeah. know. I, I think that's the, the, like, the good thing about putting everything on myself because, like, I kind of force myself to be aware of such uh, such situations as well because you don't really have people reminding you that, mm. oh, you know, you're, you're acting up again or, like, yeah, so it's something that I feel I... I didn't really realize that I was cultivating that habit. Yeah. It was more of along the way I realized that, oh, you know, if I don't solve this problem on my own, n there's no one else that's going to solve it for me. So I have to fix this. I would say my biggest step that I took this year was um, actually going for therapy. Mm. Yeah, so that was actually... Um, yeah, I would say yeah, my biggest, my biggest step forward because that was when I realized that, oh, you know, this is something that I really need to work on not it and it's not something that um I can do it on my own yeah yeah so that was when I finally decided to do so after years of like <laughs> contemplating whether I should or should not do it how yeah. has it been treating you do you do this, do this weekly or um has I've it been, been regular? trying to okay I think I have really really huge um commitment issues when it comes to sharing things okay. on a very frequent basis okay. so like you know we do this right now okay that's like hit the quota that's a lot of year, right? yeah. that's like, <laughs> that's, I don't want to share anymore yeah. for the next half of the year yeah so <laughs> I mean I didn't even know myself well enough to let people understand me and why do I not know myself well enough because I said that I do have like this whole identity issue and all these voices in my head since young mm. you know? so mm. it's kind of ironic in a sense because People always say that, oh, you know, you're like the voice for uh, younger girls. Like, mm. like people used to tell me that. But then I, I don't feel so because where's that voice coming from? It's all these people like telling me what I should or should not do. So everything is very intuitional in, in a sense where I'm just doing based, I'm doing then based on what I think is right. But I don't even know, I, I, I'm not even sure of my own values until today, which is why I felt like the need to you know, seek help and really understand myself in the process because, and the the motivation behind it was actually my, my children. If I'm not mentally well, yeah, um, I, I really can't be there for them, you know, and I can't be their um, support yeah. uh, mm. when they need me to. Right. So I think it's very important to be able, it's not, I feel like it used to put them first and mm. then I realised I, actually have to put myself first on certain days to be able to be the best I can for them you know I yeah. Mean, yeah and and I realized that problem because I was just not acting right you know like acting well yes 
precisely mm. in, this, in a sense you know that again that, that self-awareness is coming out right you know, yeah. this is what I'm aware you know I'm aware of my behaviours the impact that it might have on my kids yep. and then you know this is what I'm going to do I'm going to kind of like you know check in sometimes having a therapist um, is helpful is because um, mo- most of the time I always have the saying you don't know what you don't know Mm. But sometimes, you know, in sessions, we don't give you directions. We, we are not, uh, people will say, oh, I come to a therapist for advice. Yep. In fact, we are very non-directive. Right. So um, we, we don't give advice because we believe the answers lie in yourself, mm. right? It's more of like, how can we get you to reach there, yep. right? So, um, and that again, that process is, is the work doesn't come from us, it's actually from you know, the clients right. themselves. And from now I see Naomi, mm. you know, when you're working with a therapist. Mm. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I mean, yeah. it's good to take that first step though, recognizing yeah. that you sort of need, you know, an outside source, right? Mm. Has it been helpful? Do you feel like it's been the best thing you've done this year? It hasn't been that long for me to, <laughs> okay. to answer that yet. Okay. But um, I, I feel like it's very reassuring and that's mm. what I need as a person because of my lack of confidence. I feel like I constantly need a lot, a lot, a lot of like mm. reassurance and like affirmation. Nobody can tell, you know, that you lack confidence <laughs> yeah. to be really yeah, honest. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and, mean, and that's the thing because like the more I try to like put up this front, yeah. the more I have this problem because mm. I feel like I need to upkeep that, that, you know, that image, right? Because in order to be strong for others, I feel like I have to be strong myself. Yeah. And then when I'm not, and then I struggle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so that that's when you kind of realise I've been like very quiet on online. I think um, a lot of my followers, some of, some of them actually noticed and asked like, oh, why is it that you don't really talk as much anymore? Yeah. Or like you've been quite quiet in a sense yeah yeah and i think that's that's the issue because every time i have such struggles like um with my decisions i i become this like oh i don't know whether i should do this i, I don't know whether i should do that and then there's so much self-doubt going on that i don't really move and progress mm. okay. so th- that that becomes a problem right. yeah okay and it's like you're withdrawing you're avoiding correct, correct, you know, correct. because you don't really know what to do correct yeah right. so like i i to me that's me spiraling okay. so i've been spiraling for the last mm. half a year and then that was when i realized okay this cannot go on like let's let's okay. get this mm. f- fixed uh. yeah. yeah so naomi i know that a couple of weeks ago you did this q a and then there was like a photograph that was uploaded of you having like cut your wrist before yeah 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 can you tell us about that uh yeah sure um so so i think why are you laughing <laughs> oh my god this is so serious no, and i, I feel, feel like embarrassed talking about it no um, no don't no i feel embarrassed only because it's not that long ago and i feel like um because this happened um around 2017 okay so back then six years ago yeah Sorry, my math isn't five like the five or six is it six yeah six <laughs> Yeah, six. Yeah, yeah, six years ago. So I was twenty-one. Yeah, okay. and I feel embarrassed because I feel like I was already at the age where I should not be doing such things. No, there's no <laughs> such thing as I like correct age, yeah. Naomi. No, no. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I feel like I feel like I should be old enough to make the right decisions. You know what I mean? And I don't know because I I I mean everyone around me was just asking me why would I do that. I think I was just in a very dark place. At that at, at that period, that whole period, uh, I got out of a, uh, like a, my first actual relationship, not long before that. When I lost that, uh, two one and a half to two year relationship, I think there was this whole period where I felt really lost, uh, because it was the longest period of time where I had. A lot of validation from my partner and right. me. so the moment he was out of my life like out of this equation i felt the need to to seek validation from other mm. people again and reassurance basically so i started going into this whole spiraling phase where i i was meeting different boys every now and then yeah. and then it made the situation worse so because of this whole vicious cycle it it really, it was a breaking point la, mm. yeah, yeah. in 2017 where um, in that moment, I felt like the only thing that was going through my mind wasn't whether this is the right thing to do or not the right thing mm. to do. It was just more of what can temporarily, whether is it temporarily or yeah. not, um, just relieve me from the pain I was, the mental distress that I was dealing with at that, that, moment, in, that moment in time. Yeah, and I think that's probably a lot of 
um, that's probably something that a lot of people that I know who self-harm yeah. uh, mm. dealt with or are still de- dealing with as right, well, right. that they just want to feel something, you know. Yeah. It's like whether is it um, to, to relieve mm-hmm. from the actual pain or yeah. whether it's just to feel something because you just feel so numb, you know, like as yeah. in... Yeah. What did it what did it do for you though? I mean, um, it, it was really like a stress reliever as in yeah. like more of just trying to put the pain somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, maybe it was also to be completely honest, I think maybe it was also for attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, because I, I feel that a lot of times and especially thinking back about how I used to do it when I was younger, it was really a lot about how uh, you feel like you don't really have anyone who's actually listening to your problems or like actually realizing that there's a problem with you and in order to for people to realize it you 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 do certain mm. things to to you know like seek yes yeah their right. attention yeah so i think it was really a lot of lack of self love and love from the people that i i wanted that made me do what i did right. mm, yeah mm, mm. yeah sounds like that period of time was really overwhelming for mm. you and then that crave for maybe partly attention you mm. know in a sense you need that love mm. you know you couldn't get it and what i'm hearing the intention of that self-harming behavior seemed to be uh, more of like okay i need to feel the pain i want to cope with the pain mm. um i used to see um quite a few teenage girls who actually shared the same um they might not have the same presenting concerns but then they kind of shared the same coping strategies that you just shared so um they actually told me that you know even by looking the blood oozing out you know and sometimes i may feel the pain sometimes i might not that is relieving so the purpose is not actually to die but the purpose is you know i i just need to get the pain out and by watching it ooze out of me i literally feel like something came out right. and, and that that helped to um kind of bring that overwhelming feeling and that distress out of mm. my body mm. so um that's that's kind of like the intention yeah however that can be a little bit dangerous sometimes because over time we build up tolerance right yeah. or oh, this is not painful enough i need to go deeper yeah. i need to go longer and eventually that can be life threatening again yeah. right um maybe the intention is not suicide again however that can you know bring you to somewhere you know eventually you you might you might die yeah. right yeah. yeah and so um there's a there's a call for consent so usually um you know be, before you keep doing this i think sometimes it's um helpful to again bring that awareness to okay this might be not helpful you know what are some of the other methods then you know i can replace this with usually when when um the girl see me i wouldn't take that away immediately you know we will explore that because a lot of times there's shame like even uh, initially when you shared this with us you're saying like this is embarrassing mm. and and that's normal because i mean we're humans we feel that this is you know, this is something that i shouldn't have uh, have done but again um it is important to validate you know your distress at the point in time and maybe that's all you you could think of right um however again um is is helpful to walk through with the girls you know what are some of the other methods that you know we can actually explore that similarly can take away the pain but don't put you in a position that you know you might one day accidentally kill yourself so that's yeah. really important is there like an equivalent of something that do you know what i mean like i, I don't know yeah, if do you manage to yeah there's somebody watching now or like you know who's who's into is doing self harm you know can they do something right now to sort of alleviate their own pain okay yeah um i may share one that a lot of girls somehow normally use you know we have long hairs right we we tie like we tie with the hair bands and usually we have hair bands here yeah right um again this is replacement doesn't mean it's the most appropriate right just just a caveat here so what they do is they would have hair bands with them you know when they feel like you know i need that pain pull it pluck it is um is still is still kind of harming yourself but we just try to gradually pull it down i yeah. see that eventually we we can replace with a more healthier method of self coping yeah. and um ideally direct back to what's the source what's the trigger then work on that instead of really just dealing with the pain yeah. that okay. would be helpful yeah. yeah yeah so maybe there's one way to start off with mm. i think yeah okay. did the girls actually progress or just yes. out of curiosity or oh, that's great most of them that's do great. so nice. eventually when they receive help yeah. um however um the support system has to be there again yeah, yeah, right yeah. because without support you know it's it's really hard to um, yeah i can i help. can only imagine yeah. cuz like i feel that if anything i'm like really thankful i still had my parents there yeah. as in although i felt like they were not the people that i wanted to seek help from mm. but they were there you know what i mean yeah. so i i still feel like i'm thankful in that way mm. um and very lucky as well 
I feel it's the people that were around me that made me realize, mm, you know, yeah. it's not just me. If right. I'm gonna bring this pain on to to whoever's mm. here and whoever really loves and cares for me, mm. oh, I feel like I'm gonna cry. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So like, I feel it's because of them that I, like, I I didn't resort to that. So yeah. I'm, but I'm. I mean, I am concerned about those people who right. who don't have the, you know. The, the support the, yeah correct the support right. that they need so yeah. what what happens you know mm. or like they don't even have you to speak to right yeah and i think one of the main concerns uh, when it comes to therapy is also um expenses yeah you know, it's, I mean, it's expensive it's not it's not, yes. it's not cheap so mm. i mean it, i'm lucky to be in a position where i'm i'm able to even have the resources right mm. but what about mm. people who don't right yeah especially students right. who are who might be facing um, worse mm. situations yep. because of their age, you know, not being able to recognize certain problems or be self-aware. Like, they're just not equipped with that, right? So, what what happens to them? Mm. You know, like if I may been, jump in, yes, yeah. yes, yes, share please. a little yeah. bit more. Um, there have been, there have been um, initiatives, actually, to kind of, you know, build a community of support, especially for youths, right? Uh, like I mentioned, students, they might not have um, money to see therapists. A, a private can be pretty expensive. It, yeah. can be, it can range from about 200 to 250-ish a session or even more. So, depending on where you go as well. Mm. So um, the recent years, um, there has been this initiative called, I'm not sure whether you heard of Care Corner Insight. Mm, so no. um, mm. it is an initiative by Ministry of Health, okay. um, Institute of Mental Health, and also um, the Agency of Care and Care Corners. They started this. So you can go on this website, um, which uh, Care Corner Insight, just type in, just Google. Okay. And um, it's a one-stop service for youths who um, need help. So it can be assessment, it can be counselling services, okay. and a counseling services are fully subsidized okay um the traditional route that people will go to is okay i'm not feeling too good right i go to my gp you can actually get a referral letter to right. IMH, um, mm. the Institute of Mental Health again. Um, they also do subsidized rate of um, counselling services. Mm. And um, if you if you're open to even like some voluntary welfare organisation or charities, um, I do know of some counselling centres um, in the community that actually offers, the rate can be like about $80 per hour. Um, or per session mm. and for students it's like half price I see mm. yeah. okay that's very helpful yeah. okay. so for more, yeah. for more information I think Google you know or even reach out to like NCSS yeah. you know, all these yeah. um, government services website they mm. actually do we actually do provide yeah because, uh, so, sorry don't mind don't yeah. mind me cutting off like cause sure. just going back to um, what you mentioned earlier on you said that you know um, there are certain things where people where your clients share with you and you like for example if they are thinking of suicide or, or things like that or self-harm um, those are things that you cannot um, ensure confidentiality right so what happens if um, let's say today a student comes to you she's self-harming but she doesn't want her parents to know about it for example so what happens in a situation like that that's a very great question and okay. every time when my client tell me this i'll be like oh. yeah. because i mean i have it's not just because i have to abide by my code of ethics yeah but more importantly because i need to kind of preserve this person's yes. you know, life yeah, right? yeah, yeah, for and sure. um so a lot of times if i have rapport that relationship with that client i would explain to that person you know unfortunately you know there's something that i really need to tell someone because i'm concerned for your safety mm. so um and also before we even enter the first session this is something that would be you know i would actually share with my clients already so by the time when this person share with me he or she would already have known that okay there's a possibility that you know genie needs to tell this yeah. to somebody right. and i would do so but is there a situation because i feel like mm -hmm. this is bringing me a lot of memories right. uh, for myself like i feel that that was where i stopped going mm -hmm. you know what i mean like is there a case where like a student comes to you and then because of this mm -hmm. um specific need to like talk to their parents or their teachers and mm -hmm. or like whoever whoever their caretaker is then they mm -hmm. stop coming for right in my sessions. experience, no. Okay. However, um, I've been working with the last time in other settings before mm. where um, it, this is pretty common actually. Mm. So because or oh, because you breach confidentiality, I don't trust you anymore. Mm. I cannot talk to you. Mm. That's that's very common. Mm. However, again, right, our our first priority is client safety. Yeah. Mm. If there's no safety, you can. I don't even know whether you will be sitting here with me the next session. Correct. I would rather tell someone. Mm. I would right. Rather, you know, really 
focus on preserving your life first, right. the, the rest can come later. The reason why, right, mm. for me, I think it's more of um, not about the confi confidentiality part, but more on, because if you're talking about the very first session, I, I believe nothing is shared in that sense apart from the self-harming um, mm. like whatever you see right so I think in terms of that what if let's say um, they have people who are taking care of them that might strongly be against what they're doing yeah again like I, I, I like I, harm I, them is yeah, that yeah, right yeah yeah yeah, yeah? yeah. so like, like okay. what if it's a situation like that you know because I I feel like it might be a potential problem right mm. so maybe that is the reason why they feel that oh you know if you're if there's a need for you to tell my parents or my caretakers then then oh maybe i shouldn't come for sessions anymore because i, like, I don't want them to know about this yeah so yes I, I completely understand the safety part because that's for sure very important because you can't be with them 24 7 you don't know what's going to happen the moment they step out of your office but like what if it's what if their concern is something mm. like that you know what I mean. But is it again safety? So because what I'm hearing is maybe the parents or mm. the caregiver is going to um, kind of, you know, punish them. Yep, correct. So then in that case, it's also my duty in the sense to report to maybe Ministry of Social and Family Development. Mm. Because um, it sounds to me like this is a very systemic work that I need to mm. uh, focus on. It's not just one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. The mm. parents probably need some sort of uh, be it therapy, you know, or educational mm. sessions to really kind of beef up their understanding of yes. what the child is going through yeah. and then um, it is a family therapy work perhaps right so it re is really depending again on um, what I'm hearing so let's say if there's physical potential physical harm yeah you know to the, the child I would definitely report yeah, yeah. Mm. because again okay. safety you know and then we can work on the rest later mm. and it's not just the child who needs therapy yeah yeah yeah, yeah man yeah, 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 yeah the sure, parents for sure, for sure. yeah, yeah so like, I just feel that like these people need to feel safe you know? mm. and online. Yeah. I feel like that's what a lot of them and even myself back then when I was going through mm. the same You needed thing. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like to feel safe with someone because you feel like you don't really have anywhere that you can feel safe mm -hmm, right. <laughs> yeah, in like you don't have a, an environment or like a, an outlet to feel safe yeah so, yeah so I, I think that's really important but yeah thanks for sharing yeah nice Jeannie all we can that. say is that Jeannie's job is very hard <laughs> because uh, <laughs> to balance everything that she's doing <laughs> and trying to like maintain composure yeah. throughout it is, is pretty amazing so thank you for all your insights Jeannie Yeah, I think taking blame is very, very important and like, you know, taking accountability of something that you have done wrong. Yeah. Uh, in our case, maybe something that we have, we think that we haven't done wrong, but then, yeah. you know, we start by saying sorry yeah. and then we can move on from there.